Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Olivier, uh, the pulmonary branch uh, of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about lung disease in patients with primary immune deficiency disorders. I'd like to use two um, more commonly seen disorders, common variable immune deficiency, or CVID, uh, and chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD, uh, to discuss the conditions that are seen along with these disorders, talk a little bit about the specifics of lung diagnosis and the different modalities that are used uh, for that diagnosis, uh, and then discuss treatment uh, of these two disorders in CVID, uh, followed by chronic granulomatous disease discussion of lung manifestations, uh, diagnosis, uh, and management. A bronchiectasis is a condition that is common in many uh, immune deficiency disorders, uh, particularly those associated with antibody deficiencies uh, like common variable immune deficiency. It's characterized by ballooning or enlargement uh, of the airways uh, where they, instead of normally tapering as seen here, um, they end in these dilated um, uh, pouches um, with a saccular type appearance frequently. This is association, associated with inflammation of these airways um, and stagnation of movement of mucus and secretions. And so uh, the airways uh, filled with this sticky, thick, sticky mucus that's difficult to clear out uh, and retains particles that are inhaled, uh, including infectious particles that then elicit more inflammation uh, in the airway wall. Um, frequently, uh, as this develops, uh, patients may first notice frequent throat clearing, uh, followed by a dry cough, uh, which eventually becomes productive of sputum or wet in characteristics. Uh, it's also um, notable that patients have frequent flares many times uh, or infectious exacerbations that often require treatment with antibiotics. Uh, and as the disease progresses, a shortness of breath may be seen. In addition to antibody disorders, there are other immune deficiencies where this is commonly seen, such as STAT3 mutated hyper IgE or Job syndrome, uh, where historically up to 75% of patients will develop bronchiectasis um, frequently after the recurring infection seen early in life. This is probably much less now, given that uh, with the genetic diagnosis, many patients are put on uh, early antibiotic um, a prophylaxis to prevent many of these infections. It's also been seen in more newly described disorders, um, such as the activating uh, conditions associated with PI3K, at where bronchiectasis can be a primary manifestation. Granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease is another condition um, that may commonly be seen in CVID. Um, it um, is characterized by too much inflammation in the lung where you can get uh, aggregates of lymphocytes that infiltrate into the lung tissue um, and these characteristics granulomas, uh, which are inflammatory uh, tumors or masses that can be seen in the lung. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are like. Patients may develop this uh, without symptoms initially, uh, and it's recommended that patients with CVID uh, be screened uh, with periodic CT scanning uh, to look for these characteristic signs. Uh, as symptoms do develop, frequently patients will experience cough, uh, and as it progresses, shortness of breath. CT imaging is very important uh, in detecting these disorders early on. Frequently, chest X-ray doesn't have the sensitivity to pick up things like subtle bronchiectasis uh, or the condition uh, may be in areas such as behind the heart border um, where it's obscured on a chest X-ray. This CT, CT image is in a coronal plane with the head at the top, feet at the bottom. Um, this is uh, an, um, a picture of the left lung uh, here. This is the trachea or windpipe seen in the middle and the heart border seen here. Uh, and this cross-sectional image correlates with the cartoon of the pathologic changes seen with bronchiectasis. Uh, and it represents this fairly well as shown with the arrow connecting the two here. Uh, this is very significant uh, bronchiectasis seen here, but frequently we're looking at the comparison between the blood vessels in the lung, which you can see coursing in this plane here, and the airways that travel along with it. And generally, as you get toward the periphery of the, lane, of the lung, uh, you can't really see the airways traveling along with the blood vessel, 
uh, as noted here. Uh, in the more proximal examples here, these airways are much larger than the vessels traveling along with them, and that's generally our definition of bronchiectasis on CT scan. Granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease uh, has a different appearance on CT in the lung. Uh, this image is shown in the axial or cross-sectional plane uh, of the lung uh, with the heart represented here as being the back and the front of the patient. And in the left lung here, there's an example of one of these granulomas, uh, which is represented in cartoon form here. And the characteristic appearance of an outer ring of white blood cells called lymphocytes uh, and enter um, an inner uh, part uh, with epithelioid histiocytes and these multinucleated giant cells. These are cells that are generally um, scavenger cells that engulf uh, infectious particles, which can be seen in the center uh, of these granulomas where it's been walled off uh, from the circulation. Um, so this can be either associated with uh, uninfective um, or non-infectious um, uh, causes or can be associated with certain infections in the lung. Um, frequently to uh, assess the severity and follow the uh, progression on treatment uh, or progression off treatment of these disorders, uh, we use the pulmonary function lab and there are three characteristic tests uh, that are frequently done. The most common is spirometry and this is often seen or done uh, in a physician's office in, in addition to the pulmonary function lab. Uh, and the patient uh, breathes in and out through a mouthpiece, frequently with a nose clip in, in place. And they're asked to take in as deep a breath as they can and then blow out as hard and fast as they can until the lungs are completely emptied. Uh, this is a test that measures the degree of airway obstruction in the lung um, and can be seen uh, in disorders um, such as asthma, COPD, or in bronchiectasis. To measure the absolute amount of air or volume in the lung, there's a different test that's required, and there's several ways of doing this. This cartoon depicts uh, a body box or a plethysmograph, uh, which is generally a clear um, plexiglass uh, box uh, where we have a known volume and pressure in the box, uh, and then pressure in the lungs uh, is measured at the mouth um, by having the patients hold their cheeks together and pant uh, against a closed shutter. Uh, and once we know the pressure, we can then derive the volume uh, at that expansion of the chest and the lung. This is very helpful in uh, infiltrating disorders like uh, GLILD, um, where the reduction in the total amount of air may be decreased uh, due to the infiltration that's seen in the lung. And then diffusing capacity is a test um, where uh, patients inhale an inert gas um, that doesn't cross from the lungs into the bloodstream, along with the gas carbon monoxide that transfers very regularly, readily from uh, the airways or the air sacs uh, into the bloodstream and binds uh, to hemoglobin uh, in the red blood cells. Uh, this test measures the ability of gas or air uh, to transfer from uh, the air sacs of the lung into the blood vessels, uh, and it can be seen in uh, conditions uh, such as fibrosis of the lung, uh, it may worsen in bronchiectasis and emphysema, uh, and gives us an idea about the ability of the lungs to provide sufficient oxygen. Uh, as that begins to decrease, patients may have increasing uh, needs for supplemental oxygen uh, as disease progression occurs. Another very useful test that can be done in many pulmonary function labs is called a six-minute walk test. Um, where uh, participants are asked to walk uh, as fast uh, and as far as they can without running in six minutes uh, along a prescribed course. Um, and um, the distance achieved um, is used as one measure of functional ability. Patients generally also wear a pulse oximeter, uh, which provides information on oxygen levels during exertion. And this can be a sensitive way of uh, picking up uh, increasing uh, increasing um, desaturation uh, with exertion that might require supplemental oxygen or signal other conditions associated with lung diseases such as pulmonary hypertension. Um, with regard to infections in the lung, it's important to get specimens from in the lung um, to look at the microbiology uh, to guide antibiotic treatment. 
uh, and one of the easiest ways of doing that in patients with brachiectasis uh, is to collect a sputum specimen. Uh, many patients can spontaneously cough this up into a specimen container, uh, but some patients have more of a dry type cough, um, and we can often help to, uh, them to produce a sputum specimen by having them inhale a mist of concentrated salt water called hypertonic saline. Uh, this is usually done through a handheld nebulizer device. This tends to loosen the secretions uh, and allow more moisture into the lung uh, so that the patients can more easily cough them up. This is also used as part of therapy uh, in bronchiectasis uh, with airway clearance, where it's important to get these uh, secretions that tend to pool in the lungs cleared out uh, to prevent the inflammation and ongoing infection. Uh, and we generally will couple the use of hypertonic saline uh, with one of these handheld uh, devices called an oscillatory PEP device. PEP stands for positive expiratory pressure. And in this picture, it's shown with the device uh, connected to the nebulizer uh, where the patient can inhale the salt water mist uh, through both devices. And when they exhale, there's a variable resistor in this device, which helps to stent open the airway. And there's a weighted flapper valve uh, that sets up vibrations uh, within the airways to help again to loosen these secretions. Some patients will utilize um, percussive or vibratory devices, uh, such as a percussive vest or other handheld instruments to do the same uh, type of uh, maneuvers to loosen secretions in the airways. In sputum that's collected, it's generally sent to the microbiology laboratory. It's initially smeared out on a glass, stain, a glass slide uh, and stained uh, for a variety of organisms. Uh, with results that can generally come back on the same day. Uh, this is helpful if there are large amounts of these organisms uh, in the lung and can help guide initial antibiotic therapy. Uh, but the cultures that are done where the specimen is streaked out onto a Petri dish or culture plate shown here uh, can take a while to come back with results. For regular bacteria like Pseudomonas or Staph, that's generally about one to two days. Uh, for molds like Aspergillus, that can take three to five days. Uh, and for other organisms like non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which can be acquired from the environment like Mycobacterium abscessus or Mycobacterium avium complex, abbreviated as MAC, uh, it can take seven days for the more rapid growing organisms like abscessus, two to three weeks for MAC. And the plates are held up to six weeks to detect more slowly growing organisms. In patients that can't produce sputum or where um, small biopsies may be useful, uh, as in GLILD, uh, bronchoscopy may be indicated. This can either be done under conscious sedation, as shown here, where the patient is giving intravenous medications to make them drowsy, but still breathing on their own, uh, or under general anesthesia with a breathing tube in place. Uh, the bronchoscope is a flexible lighted tube with a camera on the end, and it can be inserted either through the nose or mouth uh, and inserted down into the lungs, into the area of abnormalities to allow more direct sampling. Um, the bronchoscopist can visualize um, where the scope is going on a screen. Um, and then once the scope is in place, a sterile salt water can be inserted through the scope uh, and suctioned back into a container that can be sent to the lab. This is called bronchoalveolar lavage, or BAL. Um, also, small, a small wire can be extended down through the scope that could have tiny pinchers on the end that would allow collection of small biopsy samples. If larger samples are needed, a different kind of lung biopsy may be done. This is a picture depicting a procedure called video-assisted thoracoscopic lung biopsy, uh, where under anesthesia, three small incisions are made between the ribs for insertion of instruments uh, in a lighted scope uh, where larger pieces of the lung can be taken. Uh, this is a more invasive but still uh, relatively um, uh, um, easily tolerated procedure uh, with low morbidity and recovery time from this. The treatment uh, of bronchiectasis um, consists primarily of airway clearance measures. This is an important part of the management of bronchiectasis, and in some cases may be more or as important as antibiotics that are used uh, for the chronic infection. This can consist of aerobic exercise, and we generally recommend 20 to 30 minutes a day on most days of the week. 
Um, and if the goals of cardiovascular fitness uh, are met in terms of target heart rates, that will generally be sufficient to cause an increase in the depth and frequency of respirations to help loosen secretions. In addition to that, as I mentioned, the use of inhaled hypertonic saline and shaking or vibratory devices uh, can be an aid for that clearance. Uh, antibiotics are frequently used. Um, these are generally guided by results of um, stains and cultures uh, on sputum. Uh, and then I just want to stress the importance of vaccines, um, the seasonal influenza vaccine, uh, the two streptococcal uh, uh, vaccines, um, and in this day and age, uh, COVID vaccination uh, is important as well. Treatment for GLILD, um, generally when this is discovered or before that, patients will have been started on immune globulin. Uh, frequently that does not have much of an impact alone uh, on the clinical course of the lung disease uh, that's seen. And other approaches can be variable. Um, most centers will utilize steroids as an initial uh, treatment of this. Uh, this tends to be a relatively uh, steroid responsive disease um, but in some patients who don't respond or uh, with long, longer term need for treatment, it's difficult to continue using the steroids due to the long term side effects that are seen. Um, a frequent approach is a steroid sparing or steroid adjunct uh, treatment would be to combine a B cell or B lymphocyte uh, blocking agent such as rituximab um, with a T-cell lymphocyte uh, blocker, such as azathioprine or mycophenolate. Patients are then followed or monitored uh, by CT scan and pulmonary function uh, tests uh, to determine uh, the length of treatment uh, and the need for uh, altering initial treatment regimens. Switching to chronic granulomatous disease, there are a variety of lung manifestations that can be seen uh, with this. Uh, pneumonia is very common um, in patients with CGD. There may be abscesses and cavities that are seen. Uh, enlarged lymph nodes uh, may be seen. Fluid around the lung, such as plural, is called pleural effusions, uh, or spread of these abscesses uh, to the chest wall, particularly with certain organisms like nocardia. There may also be inflammatory or autoimmune conditions uh, like the granulomas we discussed, um, as well as pneumonitis. Uh, often this is an exposure to things like uh, mulch where patients can present with a relatively quick onset of shortness of breath and often high spiking fevers. Later manifestations of the disease uh, include pulmonary fibrosis uh, or with honeycombing or cystic um, uh, development in the periphery of the lung. Uh, patients can develop uh, progressive COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, with air trapping and inability to completely exhale, uh, and bronchiectasis. Lung infections are common in CGD. They're the major cause of death uh, in the United States, uh, and they're characteristic organisms that are seen uh, with CGD. Um, there are bacteria such as Staph aureus, Serratia, Nocardia, and Burkholderia, uh, and fungi such as Aspergillus. And this graph shows um, these organisms uh, illustrated here, along with the areas of involvement uh, that they affect. And you'll note that the lung by far is the most common um, and that these uh, increase in frequency from staph uh, through uh, more commonly um, uh, nocardia, burkholderia, and aspergillus uh, in the lung. Infections, especially fungal infections, can have an insidious um, uh, onset. Um, sometimes patients may not manifest fever, uh, and the CT scan of the chest is essential. Um, chest x-rays lack sensitivity uh, when patients present um, with complaints in the chest. Uh, frequently, um, there is a need for biopsy to determine the microbiology cause uh, of these infections. Um, and at our institution and many others, a transthoracic needle biopsy uh, is the preferred method uh, where you see these areas of consolidation in the lung. Uh, a needle is inserted frequently by an interventional radiologist um, guided by CT scan through the chest wall into the mass. Uh, where it can either be aspirated or sometimes small biopsies can be taken. The yield of this, uh, taking all comers, is around 50%. Uh, 
uh, which is significantly higher than what's seen uh, with bronchoalveolar lavage. Also, when both of these, um, the needle biopsy and BAL are obtained, uh, the BAL only correlates with the biopsy results in less than half of the cases. Uh, and sputum is generally of low yield uh, in these infections in CGD, as the infections tend to be walled off and not connecting directly with the airway. Management of the infections includes avoidance, staying away from things like farms, mulch sites, and constructions where there may be aerosolization of infectious particles such as mold, um, and avoiding smoking, particularly uh, marijuana uh, using uh, uh, devices such as bongs um, which, or hookah pipes, which may be contaminated with mold. Prophylactic antibiotics uh, have made a significant difference in survival in CGD. Frequently, this consists of trimethoxazole or Bactrim, um, along with azole, such as itraconazole, posaconazole, or voriconazole. These are generally continued lifelong. There's also been evidence of the use of interferon gamma, which is relatively expensive, uh, but some patients may be on this uh, as well as prophylaxis. Uh, also, culture-based antibiotics, uh, where microbiologic diagnosis is key, uh, and the use of broad-spectrum empiric antibiotics, where um, a microbiologic diagnosis cannot uh, be obtained, um, and this may consist of antibiotics like meropenem, which will cover the characteristic uh, bacteria, and an antifungal like voriconazole or pisoconazole. So to summarize uh, the lung manifestations of CGD, um, they're characterized by infection uh, and inflammatory changes. They may be insidious and onset um, and with a low threshold uh, for CT scanning. It's important to obtain microbiologic diagnosis where it's possible uh, to tailor antibiotic coverage for the common infecting organisms. Um, and there may be a need for lifelong prophylaxis. Frequently steroids are used for the inflammatory uh, manifestations of the disease. Um, and uh, in patients with progressive disease, hematopoietic stem cell transplant um, before significant structural damage occurs in the lung uh, may be very beneficial in preserving uh, lung function. I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention. I look forward to the question and answer uh, part of this session. Thank you very much.